All right, very good. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. EFF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to uh, defending your rights online. So we work to protect uh, privacy, free expression, fair use. Uh, in addition to doing impact litigation, we have activism. We're trying to get good bills passed or stop bad bills from being who make uh, freedom enhancing software open source and available for free check us out EFF.org and I'm delighted to be here today thank you my name is Dwayne Gatesell I'm a lawyer in Austin Texas I handle trademark copyright and contract licensing all sorts of things and I've been uh, speaking here at Dragon Con for probably five or six years as part of the, the EFF track and I'm happy to be here glad to see you all thank you for coming out all right. Well, uh, anyway, yeah. Welcome everybody. That was fun. Uh, I see those are just coming in. So yeah, the the topic today is government surveillance transparency, and so the uh, a part of that is the Government Surveillance Transparency Act. Uh, this is an act that was introduced uh, by uh, Senator Wyden along with Gaines, Booker, and Lee uh, in the Senate. That act uh, was referred to committee, and that's where it has stayed ever since. This is actually you know, not uncommon in uh, Congress, is that uh, acts get, get written and then they don't uh, particularly uh, move quickly. But nevertheless, uh, it was trying to address an important issue. We'll talk a little bit more about that, that uh, underlying issue, uh, which is government sur uh, transparency on surveillance, or surveillance about government, uh, transparency about government. So the government, you know, has a wide variety of uh, surveillance tools, uh, and in, uh, in many cases, there uh, is, is uh, send a subpoena or a uh, national security letter, a FISA order. There's a lot of these tools, a pen register that will go to a private uh, service provider, such as you know, Google, Yahoo, uh, online service providers, as well as the phone company, uh, and in some cases. It is up to those entities whether or not they, they wish to disclose. There's no prohibition on it, but there's no requirement. Uh, in some cases, there is a prohibition. There's a gag order. Uh, in the case of a subpoena, for example, the government can go to the court and obtain a gag order that prevents the provider from telling the, uh, the end user uh, that their information has been requested. Uh, national security letters come with an automatic gag order. No court intervention is involved. Uh, in fact, we, we consider that to be uh, uh, unconstitutional, but uh, still uh, uh, not, had, not yet had the courts agree on that. Uh, but there has been uh, some more uh, transparency. So some of the other transparency laws, so as part of the USA Freedom Act, from a number of years later, this was sort of an answer to the USA Patriot Act. Or can I interrupt oh, real yeah, quick? Yeah. Just, you mentioned subpoena. I want to make sure everyone knows what a subpoena is. I mean, we as lawyers, it's part of our everyday thing, but some of you may or may not know, uh, and just how easy it is to get. Basically, for example, in a civil case, you file the case, you fill out the subpoena form, you have someone serve it, and that's that. It's really that easy to say by the subpoena, and a subpoena is just a demand for materials or documents. And so you see this not only in civil cases, but also in governmental cases, where it's just literally a form saying produce all of this sort of thing, and the organization that receives that under penalty of law has to comply. So just in case anyone didn't start anyway. No, actually, that, that's a very good point. I'm sorry, you know, that, and uh, I'll try to explain the, the, the terms, but yes, yeah, subpoena, super easy to, to provide. Uh, there are criminal subpoenas, grand jury subpoenas, uh, administrative subpoenas like FTC, for example, can issue subpoenas, and then private parties who are involved in lawsuits as officers of the court can issue subpoenas. And there is no court involvement until later. That is to say, if somebody uh, is in, they're obligated to comply, or they can challenge it, they can go to the court and say, um, you know, I, I, I want to quash, this, you know, it's a legal term of art, it's very uh, evocative, quashing something, but anyway, that's, that's the term for uh, pushing back against the subpoena, and one of the challenges is that the person whose information is being sought with a subpoena, if they don't know about it, they can't go to a court and try to quash 
the subpoena. And in many cases, the service provider, uh, you know, they get a whole bunch of these. They just don't have the interest or bandwidth in trying to push back. Sometimes, you know, they will notice. Uh, just you know, to give a, an example. There's a time when there was a subpoena for some information uh, about the New York Times that went to uh, to Google, and they noticed it was about the New York Times, and it was potentially getting information about sources. So, you know, they they push back against that that subpoena because they could tell that. That would be kind of a newsworthy thing to go after the New York Times sources. But a lot of times they don't notice. Uh, there was another example uh, where there was a, uh, uh, a request for records from Apple uh, concerning records of uh, Representative Adam Schiff, but it was done by providing a phone number without mentioning who it was. Uh, and so Apple didn't realize until later that it was Representative Adam Smith and Schiff and had a lot more you know, political implications and had at that point complied with it. But one of the reasons why we know about that is because Apple has adopted, as many of uh, the larger providers have, some best practices in providing notice to the end user as soon as they are allowed to by law. So if there is no gag order, uh, then provide notice to the end user. If there is a gag, noter, uh, gag order, uh, provide notice when the gag expires or as soon as it expires. Right, and that's one of the things about this act that a lot of people don't realize. So, for example, um, with if the government subpoenas, for example, bank records, they are required eventually to let the person know who has been subpoenaed that this has been requested. But there currently is no requirement to do so with respect to electronic data. So if the subpoena or you know, government order, you know, the other types mentioned by Kurt, if they requested emails, like happened a few years ago, where they swept in millions and millions of ordinary people's emails, there's no requirement that the government disclose, oh, by the way, we've taken in all these emails as part of our investigation. And that's what the act is designed to do, is to close that loophole uh, with respect to electronic data so that the government has to provide notice after a certain period of time rather than rely on what Kurt mentioned, the gag orders. Previously, and as lawyers, again, we trade in these kind, of, these kind of ideas and so forth, but at a very high level, I mean, Americans are supposed to be free from you know, illegal search and seizure. I mean, that's kind of the whole point. But what has happened is, particularly after 9-11, the government has kind of subverted the existing law for that purpose and is sweeping in all of this electronic data. And then when someone inquires about it, they in essence say, we don't have to do that. We can impose a gag order, like in the instances that Kurt mentioned. The government can say to Google, no, you can't talk about it. No, you can't say anything about it. They're imposing these restrictions and the act is designed to set time limits and say, no, you can't rely on a gag order that's permanent. You have to notify the people, for example, after 180 days, or if there is, you know, if it's an ongoing criminal investigation, it's going to hurt um, a person to, to uh, disclose that information. It can be prolonged, but the idea is to say, this shouldn't be permanent, that people really ought to know that they are a target or that their data has been taken in by the government should be notified so they can do something about it. So that is kind of generally the purpose of, of the act. Yeah, and this is, this is a very good thing because, you know, as I have yeah, that we're in, eh, you know, uh, opposed to government surveillance, you want to have appropriate limits, make sure that it's only being done when it is necessary, when it is proportionate to the crime being investigated. But to be able to do something about that, and to, to talk to the public, to talk to the legislatures about the issues around government surveillance, it is best to know how much is going on, to be able to talk about real examples and where it's working, but without that transparency, it is hard to do so. And so this helps solve for some of that problem. And, and you know, there's also uh, an, an indefinite gag. Uh, means you could, might never know, so it shifts the burden uh, onto, the, onto the government. Another one of the things that, that uh, this bill was, was trying to address by having fee shifting so that if you uh, challenge a gag and uh, succeed, then the government will pay the attorney's fees. Because it's also somewhat burdensome to, to challenge all these gags. And you know, uh, 
or for subpoena compliance and issues around that for a service provider. It's a cost center. It's not something that's going to help their business other than sort of this happy feeling that they are protecting people's rights. But it, it is is a you know abstract thing. So if they have to spend lawyer time uh, doing these challenges, they're only going to do it when it is a noticeable thing, like going after a representative or a major newspaper, but not necessarily for the average civilian. But if there's some of that fee shifting, that can ease a little bit of that burden. Yeah, because the costs are are substantial. I mean, that everyone knows lawyers are expensive. You know, I would not want to pay my own fees, just as a, as a matter of course. Um, I had a, a company that received a subpoena two weeks ago. You have to comply with this not related to this particular issue is in the civil context, but even so, it's an involuntary thing that is received, you have to comply with, you have to provide these documents, and that means somebody has to round all this up, either the physical documents or the electronic data or so forth, in order to comply and say, okay, because the subpoena asks for X, Y, and Z, here is our stack of materials that complies with X, Y, Z, that takes time and money. And so it's a very important point that there is this component to the act, again, whether it passes is a different thing, but that if the government requests, and says, you, sir, thou shalt produce X, Y, Z, and you, you resist, and the government loses, the government would have to pay your attorney's fees for complying with that. Because, again, it is a, it is a huge burden, so it's an important part of, of that provision. So another... another uh, aspect uh, I think is important is they're going to the uh, administrative office of the courts already is doing an annual report on the number of wiretaps that are being issued by uh, by the court system, uh, and that's a very useful piece of transparency information. Wiretaps are you know, when they're listening into a, a phone call, um, and is can you expand that to the surveillance of stored communications, uh, the interception of metadata and the number of gag orders. So stored communications, that, that's like your emails, your text messages, uh, which, you know, in the modern era, more of our communications are going over email and text messages than they are from live phone calls. So I think that's a very important thing to add in, especially since that also has the content, the very you know, the meaning of your message is, is part of that. And so it is as invasive as a, as a wiretap. Uh, the metadata, so metadata is a term for data about data. So for example, on a uh, you know, message, the content of the message uh, is the actual thing that you say. The metadata would be things like, you know, who did you text uh, or who did you call? Uh, how, you know, if you were in a phone call, how long you spoke, uh, what time uh, of day it was. And metadata can be very powerful. In fact, it can actually give you the, the message. Example would be if you're on the uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge and it's uh, 2 a.m. and you call the suicide prevention hotline, uh, you don't have any content of that communication, but you still might have a pretty good idea of what that person talked about. And the, so metadata is a, is a way that if it's not given the same protections uh, as, as content, is a, is a back door to being able to get the content. And then finally, the, the piece they want to add for this annual report is the number of gag orders. And that also is like a sense of how big an issue of this is. Um, and we'll see what also might change that because um, for a long time, government, when they were asking for uh, information, instead of getting a gag order, they would just write a letter atop the subpoena say, could you please not disclose this? You know, this is a very important investigation. We're concerned that if this person finds out bad things will happen, so please don't disclose it. Uh, and what, what we have asked is a best practice for all the service providers says, well, if all that's true, go get yourself a, a gag order from the court, prove up to the court that it meets the standard. You'll just ask us to be, to be quiet. And uh, a number of companies have, have agreed to do so, and hopefully they are, they are, they are doing that. Getting the number of gag orders would give some insight into that information. How that's going. There's, it seems to be a pretty simple process for them, for the government. Historically, and this has been part of the thing trying to rectify, it, right? Is that you? It, it's kind of been yeah. just a rubber stamp, right? Absolutely. It, it's not like a super high standard. They just have to 
show that it's going to disrupt the investigation or that the you know the criminal, the alleged criminal, might found out they might flee the country and such. You know, like they can show that uh, to a court, and if they're doing an investigation of a real crime, and that they, you know the, the court will be like, "Yep, sounds good to me." Uh, but they have to go through their paces, and I think that's a very important thing about you know thinking about uh, a surveillance process is that uh, uh, to preserve our rights, we have to have judicial involvement and have the government go through its paces and, and meet the standards by law and not just work around it. And maybe I'm just cynical about this, but to me it seems as though uh, ever since 9-11 that it's almost a pro forma thing, that yes, they're going through the paces, but in this, this kind of rote way, you know, they're saying the magic words without any real in-depth investigation to determine whether this is proper or should be allowed. And I think the government has kind of gotten used to it, and one of the reasons why they push back on this sort of thing, I want, and I'm sure you probably will, um, talk about how EFF fought and filed a lawsuit to unseal some of these documents that have been held you know, for so long that, again, the government pushes back on it, and it tends to be regardless of administration. It's the feeling of no, 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 this is ours. This is not yours. It's not you, the people. It's ours. And we don't have to and we don't want to disclose it. And so despite what the law says, despite what the intent is, there's still this resistance to actually let the people know what the government is doing supposedly on its behalf. Yeah, that is, and uh, so a, a couple of things to, to so uh, we've had a number of actually law- lawsuits in this area, and, and one of them, uh, a, a little bit of a backstory. So... There is a a court called the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. It is a super secret court. It meets uh, in a uh, SCIF, which is a sensitive compartmentalized information facility, which is basically a room that is a Faraday cage, uh, so no electronic communications can get through the the walls. It's in the uh, courthouse in the District of Columbia. And uh, this court, only the government, argues before this court and they go there to say uh, you know we need to do this surveillance for foreign intelligence purposes here's why and they have a really really highly successful uh, rate of getting their applications uh, approved uh, the government will, will tell you that's because they're just so good at writing these applications and that they would never ask for one that wasn't obviously going to be approved other people might say it's more like it's a rubber stamp and it is uh, uh, providing the government with more uh, more surveillance powers than they need, but it's a very secretive process. And so as part of the, uh, the USA Freedom Act, one of the things that, that uh, came out of that was uh, uh, to reform the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, and uh, not a complete reform, not all the things that we might have liked, but a couple of things that were useful. So uh, one was that uh, there would be uh, the opportunity for... Uh, what are called amicus briefs, amicus Latin for friend, and law we love to use a lot of Latin for reasons. Uh, so an amicus brief would allow third parties who weren't the government to, to present uh, an argument on a legal issue to that court, uh, wouldn't get access to the actual facts or what the foreign intelligence surveillance was, but at least on the legal issue. Another part was more transparency in what the, uh, the FISC's opinions were, and they were supposed to, you know, uh, do inappropriate redactions, release some of these, these opinions, and then they, they uh, well, they didn't. Uh, it took them, or at least uh, it wasn't until we did a, uh, a request under the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, uh, to the FISC and went through, uh, through the DOJ and did a bunch of processes to try and get this information, and uh, I guess a month ago, uh, seven opinions with, with a lot of redactions were released, but they did give some uh, some insight uh, into the basis of the court's uh, decisions. And this is a very a useful aspect of transparency, even if you don't know the actual facts of the, sur- uh, the surveillance involved, uh, you know, the foreign intelligence purposes and so on, that the legal reasoning or understanding of how to they interpret the law uh, can be very useful for understanding what reforms are needed to this law. And uh, so we're, we're glad to, to get that information. And then another uh, transparency uh, work that we've done in this space was uh, representing some recipients of national security letters 
who were, were challenging the gag surrounding those uh, those letters. Uh, and so uh, with this this resulted in, in some success, uh, which is to say that you know, we can identify the clients who we had, uh, which was Cloudflare and Credo Mobile, and we've also represented the Internet Archive. All three of them have received national security letters and were initially gagged from even saying whether or not they had ever received a letter. Uh, and uh, so they are, well, are allowed to say, yes, indeed, they received one. Also part of the USA Freedom Act was uh, a change to how you can do transparency reports about national security letters. Though the government still wants to maintain a fiction that maybe it could have been zero. So if you go look at you know, like Google's transparency report, uh, you will see something like, during this time period, we received zero to 499 national security letters. And so under, under this, this uh, statute, they, uh, they have to put the zero along with it up to 499 uh, to make sure there's a possibility that nobody got a national security letter about them at Google which may seem unlikely. Uh, also, uh, you know, prior to getting a national security letter, you could put, just put zero. Uh, so if you ever see a, a service provider transparency for it, say zero for a number of years, and then say zero to 499, this would be an example of metadata, giving you some uh, information about what's happening. That means they got at least one. So I personally think that you're not really revealing any uh, information that will endanger the national security if people know that Google got a national security letter or AT&T got a national security letter because you can pretty much expect and if you're somebody who the government is interested in you're not going to have any useful additional information with the notion that there was even a specific level there were like you know 123 national security letters this is still not going to be actionable intelligence from uh, somebody and it would provide more transparency but nevertheless here we are Zero to four ninety nine. Though if you get over five hundred, you can go five hundred to nine ninety nine, and so on. So there's a little bit more uh, transparency in that way. Yeah, to the extent that uh, you know, that's just a rounding error. So, you know. Yeah, and but I mean, I you know, these are these are baby steps, uh, and so yeah, the, the the government surveillance transparency act would be a would have been a major uh, step forward, uh, but. Uh, you know, just to, to segue for you know what are what are some of the challenges? Uh, Congress is is very difficult for anything to happen. Not just this bill, but for, for many other bills, there's a lot of uh, uh, partisanship that uh, makes it difficult to to get something passed. You need 60 votes, so that means you have to have uh, bipartisanship to to move uh, bills through the uh, House and then in the committee. It has to be something that they think can move. Now, I would say this is, should be a nonpartisan issue. Uh, regardless of, of uh, who is in power, uh, they, as Lynn was saying, they all like to have their, their surveillance. And one of the things that, that we've noticed, I mean, I've been working on government surveillance uh, you know, at EFF since, since 2004, so that's over the course of a wide variety of uh, administrations and you know, both Democrat and Republican, different, different presidents. And they all like their surveillance powers. They all want to keep secrecy about it. Uh, oftentimes, the party out of power will be uh, uh, suspicious of the other party's use of surveillance powers, but then they'll, they'll swap back and forth. And that's why I think that we should get past that and, and try and get some of these, uh, these surveillance reforms. In. But, but it is challenging. Yeah, I think one of the, the larger challenges to that is that there's a tendency First of all, most people don't read. I know, I know that everybody in here does because you're here, and so you're interested in, in current events and topical issues and your rights and so forth. But the sad fact is most people don't. I think the statistic is something like 60% of the population gets its, quote, news from Facebook, which, <laughs> sorry, that's not news. So for something like this, when you're dealing with that kind of percentage of lack of understanding, it makes it very, very easy to dumb down something that is surveillance or security related and pass it off to the masses as, what, you want to give rights to criminals? Oh no, that's bad, right? Because it's very easy, and again, this is the cynic in me about our, our 
politicians in general, that it's very easy to convince the people who don't understand or don't read or don't dig that this is bad because it gives rights to those who are already under suspicion of a crime. And it, it really kind of ignores the whole, again, legal thing of, you know, aren't you supposed to be assumed you know, innocent until proven guilty? Aren't the, don't these rights mean something to us? Um, and so as Kurt said, this should be a nonpartisan issue, but it is very, very easy for those who are not in power or have their own vested interest or they want to control things or they want to enhance their own position to just use the simple sound bites and most people will go along with that. It's a much more nuanced view to say, well, okay, sure, you're notifying people, but in the event of an ongoing criminal investigation that can be extended, et cetera, et cetera, it's much, much easier just to say, oh, no, that's bad because that would hurt, hurt that, harm our judicial system. And people are like, yeah, that's bad. I think one of the other things that, that makes transparency really important in this regard is that uh, uh, if people are getting notifications and about uh, the surveillance that, that is conducted against them, then uh, one of the things Frederick is when surveillance is conducted against somebody who is innocent, and you might never find out, and getting that information out there. Because, of course, if, if surveillance is conducted against uh, someone who's a, a alleged criminal and then they end up getting charged and tried, they're going to find out about the surveillance. But that creates a snapshot that might... Uh, lead you to believe that surveillance is only being done against somebody who is eventually being tried and sometimes they're you know, found uh, not guilty but uh, that the surveillance of somebody who like they, they looked and then the, no, no case was formed you might never find out about it and not realize how many people are being surveilled and the other aspect of the, you know, one of the things that we've, we've really tried to push back against is the suspicionless surveillance and just to, you know, this is when you search through a wide variety of people's records for uh, a keyword or for uh, you know all the phones that were in this particular area at a particular time, and so you're sweeping up into that surveillance, not just somebody who there's an individualized suspicion about that person that provides the basis, the probable cause to believe that you know evidence of crime will be found there. But they're saying, let's look at all of the people, no matter you know whether they're they're you know, uh, suspected of a crime or not, within this zone as an investigative technique. And uh, you know, some of the issues that have come about is that there have been uh, surveillance programs designed for foreign intelligence. You know, this coming out of 9/11, we gotta find the terrorists. But they involve sweeping up massive amounts of, of communications of you know innocent uh, Americans. And the, the government's point of view is, well, it doesn't really count until we look at it, but we have it. But this has a, has a number of bad effects. As one is, in my view, if you are collecting it, that is that is a Fourth Amendment issue. Like this is this is happening. The government is doing something, and you know, waiting till a human looks at it is is not the the point that the you know founders cared about when we're coming up with the, with the Fourth Amendment. But uh, as well, if you have all these these uh, you know, electronic records going back for years, this also creates something which is very powerful for the possibility of an authoritarian and tyrannical state to have is a time machine. That if you never came under suspicion for many years, because what you were doing at the time perhaps was lawful at the time, uh, but something changed, and, and you know what what was uh, protected dissent before now becomes evidence of sedition. Now go back in time and see the communications that were had in the past that could never have been obtained under the prior legal regime. So to, to be able to protect against that surveillance and the storage of that is, is a way to inoculate against a future tyrannical or authoritarian government. And I think that's good civic hygiene if we want to like help preserve our, our democracy to make sure that we have those protections in place while we can so that information can't be misused later. Now, how does this have to do with transparency? Well, transparency gives the information that is very useful for policymakers to be able to make the arguments why the law needs to be changed to address this. And also where people like you can come in is when you know, the, these acts uh, uh, come out to call up your representative and say that you support it and let the, the legislatures know that this is something that is, uh, is important to you as a as a voter, as a member of your uh, constituent. 
Yeah, because I mean, this kind of gets back to an earlier point, but building on that, if the government is taking in this data and it's in a repository, you know, current administration might not use it, next administration might not, or maybe it's just a rogue official, but someone could, and it's there, and it's there to be used. And if it's there to be used, someone is going to use it. Someone's going to find a reason to use it. And so if it's not there, there's less of that risk of harm or mischief or whatever it might be. But I'm always reminded of, and I'm paraphrasing Ben Franklin here, that those who would trade liberty for security don't deserve either. There comes a point where you have to say, okay, we really, as citizens, even if we can't control what the government is doing, we at least have the right to know. We at least have the right to say and to push back and say, no, you really shouldn't take this information. Because in the instance of electronic data, for example, this happened to millions and millions of people. It's not a matter of, oh, it was only the criminals. It's only the people who deserved it. It's the old thing, right, about they came for my neighbor and I did nothing, and then they came for me, and oh, that's a problem. And that that's kind of always, I think, human nature in general tends to be kind of selfish. You know, when my neighbor loses a job, that's a shame. When I lose my job, that's a tragedy. Well, in, to a certain extent in a democracy, we're all in this together. And if you lose your rights, that affects me. And so if we have a government doing things and there is no transparency to that, and we don't have any ability to either stop that or know about it or get our fees or so forth from an unsuccessful attempt, then we're basically just trading away our rights. We're trading away our liberties. And the thing about it is, is you never get it back. You know, when that changes and those rights are gone, you cannot boomerang back. It just hardly ever happens. It just becomes, okay, that's the way it is, and then it gets a little worse, and it gets a little worse. So you kind of have to take a stand. So it really is, it is an important thing to realize what your rights are, what your abilities are to as Kurt said, notify your, your congressman or congresswoman and say, yeah, I think we should have a transparent government. By the way, if anyone has any questions, we have a microphone up front. Feel free to uh, raise your hand, yeah. come up, whatever, at any point in time. Yeah, come on down. You want, you want uh, surveillance generally, surveillance transparency? All right, brave soul coming forward. Hi. Um, so I'm really invested in a case that's going on in Colorado right now. Um, the EFF actually filed a, an amicus brief regarding it um, and Google keyword searches and dragnet searches. Um, obviously, they're you know investigating a crime, so they're they're trying to get to their suspect, and they really didn't have any evidence to get there, so they had to go to Google. Google provided them several people that hit certain search criteria. Obviously, they got their suspects from that. The case has moved forward. But there were also people on that list that were not suspects, that were DoorDash drivers that just happened to be delivering to the same street that the Google search was regarding. You know, I wonder, with the transparency issue, you know, do you think that, because millions of people were in the first search, which then whittled down to a few people, which then whittled down to the suspects. Do you think they would be interested in notifying the millions of people that were in the search? Just the people that were hits on the, the result? Like, how does that work? And just in general with that case, like, do you think that the case law of a case like that going through the courts might actually push the laws forward more than the Senate or um, Congress? So a uh, num number of good questions uh, raised there. So uh, I'll just say that I, uh, my, my colleague, Jen Lynch, uh, wrote that uh, amicus brief. I, I didn't work on it uh, personally, though I'm, I'm aware of the case. Uh, and, and it's an important one. I've looked a little bit more at the geofence uh, warrant issues, which is, which is similar. Uh, but uh, sort of in, in, in these kinds of cases right now, as you say, it, it is an investigative technique to get information about people who match a certain criteria, regardless of whether that criteria itself is you know, evidence of, of, of a crime. Um, and uh, you know, with, with geofence, it's just whether you happen to be in an area at, at the, you know, the time that they're, they're interested in. And, you know, those areas can be a fair number of people who are just innocently passing through. So uh, on the transparency uh, bill, the idea is that everyone whose information would, would get notified 
And I think that, uh, that there's a, you know, a decent chance that if a million people got a notification saying that, you know, the government was up in your grill uh, about what you were searching for on, a, on, a, on Google or, or you know, uh, that would inspire some people to reach out to their representatives. I mean, actually, one of the things that made you see people like kind of you know, joking things, but like uh, the medical bracelet, erase my search history, right? People see this as a very sensitive piece of information that, that is, uh, you know, it's about some weird thing that they thought of. It, it is, uh, uh, you know, a personal idea that they had is not something they really want the, the government doing it. And also, uh, uh, this is you know, reminding me of there's a thing that happened it was a long time ago. Uh, back when there was, was another company, some of you may have heard of, America Online. If you don't know what that is, ask your parents. Uh, but uh, someone had done a study, uh, it was supposedly anonymized, but a study of what things had, had been searching for, but it wasn't anonymized very well. Uh, and uh, they, they found some, some search terms which were very interesting, involving like, you know, uh, uh, how to hide evidence of a, of a crime and some things, that, you know, basically suggesting somebody was plotting a, a, a murder or a gruesome one. And then uh, somebody else did some investigation. So it turned out the answer was it was someone who was an author who was doing research for a murder mystery that they were writing. But yes, they were making these search terms. But like the search terms without additional context were like, you know, very, very scary. And I think that sort of thing that comes to people's minds, you know, they may have searched for something which they were just curious about, or maybe they were, you know, writing a thing or writing for whatever, but it would look bad without context. So that's one of the things that transparency would, would help on that. The other thing that you, you asked about is, well, also going through the courts. And yes, going through the courts, you know, impact litigation is, is part of what we, we try to do at, at EMF. And that is because the, the Constitution is a very powerful thing. And the constitutional rule would mean that even if there were a congressional statute that said this was okay, they still can't do it because the constitution says that you can't. And you know that can be that can be very uh, uh, useful when you can when you can do it. You need to know about these things to challenge it. In that case, we, we, we do know, and I I don't recall exactly. I believe that was because Google said something. I know in a geofence warrant case, they were the one who, who, who brought a challenge and, and pushed back. Um, in other cases, when we don't know about it, right, you can't have that constitutional challenge. And to give an example out of that, uh, you know, right after 9-11 uh, and the Patriot Act and such, they, the, the administration did something which they uh, later called the Terrorist Surveillance Program. Uh, at the time, it was codenamed Stellar Wind. Uh, and uh, it was super secret for, for many years. No one knew anything about it. And then some news stories came out that were uh, about some aspects of it in 2005. Uh, and then uh, we, the EFF filed a lawsuit against us saying that this uh, NSA surveillance program was unconstitutional. Uh, and we first started a lawsuit against at t for doing it. Then Congress passed a special law to give them retroactive immunity. So we sued uh, the NSA over doing it. And that case, uh, well, it didn't work out. And why didn't it work out? Not because the court said that what they're doing was constitutional, but instead the government said the state secret privilege meant that the case couldn't go forward, that we couldn't come to a determination about the constitutionality because it was too secret to litigate the case. And part of that was saying that things that, that came out that were on the front pages of, of national newspapers, you know, things that you may have seen in the Snowden documents, that those were all still secrets. We couldn't confirm or deny whether those were actually true. And so you couldn't litigate about the facts that came out uh, in, in the Snowden uh, leaked documents. And I think that's another example of where we had whistleblower transparency, but it wasn't enough because they used the state secret privilege. And we, need to get some reforms there because that prevented the actual decision about whether the Fourth Amendment allowed them to do that massive search program. It's kind of like saying, no, it's double secret probation, yeah. right? Yeah. So you can't, no, yeah, no don't, don't, don't even point. Yeah, the question, yeah. So it's pretty depressing that right now the fight is, have the government let us know after they spied on us with no suspicion? Assuming we do pass this and there's some smoking gun, what's the next 
legislative act. I mean, even if an act of Congress, I can't imagine you can actually get your data back from the surveillance state. I, that certainly would be within Congress's power to put a data retention period where they have to if you turn out that uh, uh, you know there's an innocent person, they have to destroy it within X days. They could, they could, Congress can do all sorts of things, but I think your question might be more about political will than than the well, that's the, even if the power. Just the, uh, you know, like state secrets, the, the three letter agency will take a copy and not give it back. Yeah, no, the state secret privilege, very problematic. Uh, and it was uh, uh, fun, funny in a depressing way about the state secret privilege. So that, that privilege was created in the 1950s uh, by the Supreme Court involving a case in which a, uh, a bomber, uh, which was being tested for, you know, as, as uh, part of a secret program, crashed. <laughs> And the relatives of the uh, the airmen who, who died in that crash sued uh, uh, the government for saying that they were being negligent in that crash. And the government said, "Oh, this program was so secret, we, we can't tell you what's going on here," and so that was that was the rule. Uh, and then, uh, fifty years later, that was that information was declassified. Turns out. It wasn't a particularly secret thing, and they were totally negligent, and that's why they, they crashed the plane. And so the very basis of this uh, rule that you have to stop certain cases when the government says that litigating this will reveal secrets was when they were bullshitting and trying to cover up their negligence, which resulted in several air crew losing their lives. So to answer your question a little differently, yeah, you're right, it's depressing. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, the government has all the power they have all these tools and the, you know the best that we can hope for is the, are these tiny little incremental steps to try to make it a little bit better but you know again when they can say no it's double secret probation what do you do you know, unless you have a progressive court to strike that down you know, a different type of court that might be more conservative say is going to always not always but 99.9 percent .9 of the time stand up for security and surveillance and that kind of so despite what seems to be reasonable, that might go to die at, say, the Supreme Court, for example. So, I mean, I, I would say I, I'll push back a little bit on the progressive conservative aspects. There are a number of, of conservative, like Federalist Society, in the world conservative judges who do care a lot about the, the Fourth Amendment. And Justice Scalia, was, you know, no, no one would say was very progressive on many things, but uh, on the Fourth Amendment, uh, he was he was on the, the side of a number of uh, important decisions uh, upholding the the Fourth Amendment. Um, so I mean it, it, it does happen, but I think that from one of the concerns I have about the judicial system is so many members of the judiciary, their path to becoming judges was being a federal prosecutor. More often than not, that is you know you, you know you're you're an AUSA or you know an assistant. United States attorney, or even a you know, political appointee, U.S. attorney, and then you get you know nominated for for a judgeship, and you come from the perspective of a, of a prosecutor, and it is more uh, I think uh, better if you may pull some of the people from like the Federal Defenders Program uh, and have a, a bit of experience with the criminal justice system. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. It's kind of doing what you know. Uh, also, I mean, on the you know, it, it, it is you know, many of these things can be depressing. But I, I try to be an optimist, and I think that that it is important that we all try to do what we can, as hard as we can, until we can't do it anymore. And so, you know, you, there are things you can do, which is you know, getting active, reading up about the issue. As Jim was saying, you know, you're, you're other people that, that care enough about to do the reading, but also reach out to to legislatures and let them know. How, how you feel about it. Let your friends know about something that's important. If there are people who are getting all their news from, from Facebook, then you can uh, you know, post some of these things on their Facebook feed so people are more aware of the issues. Get more awareness out there and do what we can. Yeah. Before we get to your question real quick, I just wanted to, to throw in that sometimes I appear cynical about things, and I am about government and politicians in general, but where I really have faith is in people and in humanity. And I see this all the time. If you ever try try a case in front of a jury, you see 12 strangers that don't know anything about any of the issues and so forth, and yet time after time after time, they 
come together to try to do the right thing. And that's what people in general are. People, most people, are trying to do the right thing. And that gives me hope to see that people, when they're informed, will try to do the right thing. And that's why, to your point, you know, if you get involved, if you support the EFF, if you do certain things, you notify your, your Congress people. To be informed and stay active, things can change because the cynical politicians, they don't want things to change. They want to frustrate and dissuade and turn people away from the process because then they have more control. And it's when the people understand and say, no, that's enough. That, again, that's what gives me hope. So I'll get off my soapbox, please. Uh, but, but a good point. I think that's the you know, rely on the people over the politicians. Go, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, two separate questions. One is you brought up the Snowden revelations and the throughput of the taps on AT&T and the other providers about the massive throughput of data that they were banking, basically everything from everyone everywhere whenever they wanted. Are we assuming that that's not still being banked now in gigantic data warehouses? That uh, not to be actively searched, mind you, but to be retroactively searched in the case of, I don't remember how it was written, but in case something horrible happens, like in the case of the Boston bombing, you know, the marathon bombing, they immediately started plowing through all the data they had been accumulating surreptitiously that nobody was aware of, but they had this. Not so, that it helped. We ended up getting it with cell phones, but anyway, please. Uh, on, on that point, uh, we have we have some pretty big clues that the answer is yes. Uh, the uh, There is a, a data center built by the government uh, outside, I think, near Provo, Utah, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, it's a we know a little bit of information about it, like square footage and how much power it draws. Obviously, mm -hmm. not what goes on inside. Uh, but uh, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. But some people who you know, knew about large server farms, based on square footage and power draw, made some estimates. And yes, it would be a tremendous uh, amount of of data able to be to be stored there. This is uh, where metadata would be sealed by national security, because all you'd have to do is follow where the Freon shipments went, you know, yeah. wherever they have the air conditioning, they must be underground, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so, and, and uh, you know, uh, and if you make a, a realistic assumption that uh, they are they are keeping the data for, you know, as long as, as they can, and also uh, compressing the, the data to uh, something you so a lot of the data by volume that goes over the internet is things like video. But once you have a hash of it, you know it's the same video as the next person's video, then you don't have to store every single copy of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, if you get rid of, you know, dedupe uh, a lot of that, that data by volume and you're just getting down to things like email messages, you know, uh, uh, strings that, that are sent to search providers, for example, uh, then you know, that, that is a relatively much, I mean, still huge, right, but relatively compact compared to uh, the raw data. And one of the other things that, that uh, according to some DOD documents or uh, NSA part of the DOD, uh, is you know, what the plan is that, that came out of the Stone Revelation would be to hold on to encrypted material until such time as it can be decrypted. And uh, one of the things that was actually a tremendous uh, cause for, for you know, hope and optimism about protecting ourselves that came out uh, in the wake of the, uh, the Snowden documents is that there was a, a, a sharp increase in the number of websites that are encrypted so that your communications your websites are, are encrypted. And there was that. Well, it, one of the really good anonymizers works by spang, spamming out fake PGP documents just as a lure okay. to try and bog down the system. Bog down the system. <laughs> I mean, but I, I think that uh, uh, the for encryption is very important. It's good to get things encrypted, right? So that that is that is key. And for the web, it's now like in the high ninety percent of, of the web being encrypted. One, because of uh, uh, that now you can get free certificates. It's a program that, that EFF worked on with some others uh, to have a, a free certificate authority. Uh, so it's easy for people to encrypt it. Also, search for not just Google but but the others as well. Uh, have search engine optimization that having an encrypted site means that your search uh, is, is going to be higher on top than an unencrypted one. So that gives a strong incentive. So we have a lot of this encrypted. 
And actually, I believe that like the, the math behind the encryption is good and it will be a long time before they can just straight up break it. But most of the problems with encryption is in the implementation and then a flaw is discovered in the implementation that like, yeah, the math was all good, but it wasn't truly a random number or something like that. And so that's what we have to worry about for, for uh, encryption problems. And if I can just make a quick pitch, he and I are talking about encryption tomorrow right. at 1130 and what the government is trying to do to strip that away. So. Come right back here because, yes. Same, you know same place, yeah. Same bat time, or different bat time, but same bat channel. Yes. Sorry, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit further. Uh, I, I really when following this as myself, something that's probably more important than anything else is having a, a legislative champion for these issues. So you mentioned like Senator Ron Wyden. Uh, but I don't know if I've read any similar champions from the House, so I was wondering if you guys had anybody or anybody you would point to in the House that champions these issues, like someone like Senator Ron Wyden. So, uh, well, I'll, I'm pulling up the, the bill information here because it did say uh, that Reps Liu and Davidson were leading the House companion to this bill, so they, they were doing that. But I, I would also say that, like, as an individual, the champion you should have is your representative. And the thing is that your representative might not be a champion, right? But calling up the your representative, writing writing to them, communicating on the, on the issue to help you know see what your the constituents want. And then just as, as like, if you want to get active on this, I mean, so one way to try and make it easy is like at EFF, we have like action alerts and tell people, uh, here's a good time to do it, provide some suggested text. But you could also just do it by reading about the issue and reaching out. The most effective way, I guess the, the most effective way is to set an appointment and go visit them in their local or, or DC office. The next most effective would be a phone call and talk to them for a while and then like a custom paper letter and basically, the more effort you put into it, and the more like of a traditional method, the more weight that that has. All the way down to like sending them an email that's the same email as everyone else sends them, and then they just sort of you know put it in a pile and see how high the pile is. If you, if you again, cynic in me showing, if you really want to make an impact, donate a bit of money to your local representative, and then follow it up with a letter because then it's not just, oh, you live in my district. Oh, this person has actually donated. I think I'll listen a little more. It's sad, but that's that's the way it is. Sorry, I'm back. Uh, I'm back. So there's no way to immunize the system like FISA or just using the rubber stamp of silence under the grounds of national security. There's no way to immunize that against people abusing it for political agenda or generals playing cover my ass, you know, any of that kind of thing. Has anything really good ever eked out just showing that it is being used to, well, you can't say that because it'll make the army look bad, or you can't say that because that'll reduce recruitment or, or whatever. I'm not specifically picking on the military. I just happen to know that was a big one in my dad's time. You said anything that made him look bad, you found yourself scrubbing toilets. You say it again, they don't find you at all. You know, you get posted to the Arctic or whatever. Well, one thing actually, you know, a piece of perspective on this. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court was a reform. Because before that, they weren't even going to a judge at all. So that, like, a one-sided court that meets in secret and only the government can argue from was actually a reform from the prior system of them just doing it. So, in that sense, it was a reform. It's just not enough. And so the, you know, and then the USA Freedom Act had a further reform where uh, they have to have some transparency about their legal arguments and give the opportunity to other people to present to the judges alternative arguments. And the hope, the hope that I have is that these judges, they are not just going to be rubber stamps if they know what the arguments are. And these are, these are regular judges. They are appointed to do this in addition to their, to their regular job. So it's not a special judge that only does this. Uh, and so they, they have the possibility of, of you know, we do. Uh, I believe it is the Chief Justice. And we get to know who they are, too, as a list. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall offhand, you know, 
there's some requirements. They have to be able to be within a certain distance of their super secret courthouse so they can get there and do things in person. Like cause you can't, you know, email and all these sorts of things. Uh, so it's a you know a smaller pool of judges that are possibly in it, but that that part exists. And to to hope, what we have seen from this actually is is sometimes there has been some pushback against misuse. Uh, like there was. Uh, Called Love It. So, uh, this is this is uh, so you know, uh, Sig Int is signals intelligence, right? So, and Hume Int is human intelligence. So, Love Int was like a play on words for that because it was when people working for intelligence agencies were looking up like their ex girlfriend to find out what you know she was up to, which you know, they some people got caught doing that. Uh, and this this came out, and uh, th those people you know were, were duly. Uh, uh, punished or such but like you know it was like six people and I suspect this happening far more often but like things like this have happened when, when people have have gotten busted this is sometimes done through an inspector general which is a you know uh, for every agency there's an inspector general which actually, and then somebody whistleblows within the organization and they can do so in a quiet manner so they don't get shipped off to Alaska or whatever all right we only have a couple minutes left so we have one more question so I'll, uh, thank you I would like to explore the latest modality of surveillance, and that's our cars. I noticed that new cars are coming with very strong connection to the internet. And so now we have yet another group of people who will have a volume of metadata on us. And I purchased a car recently, and the salesperson, after the deal was completed, took my phone, loaded an app, and to my surprise, I can find out where the car is parked, lock the windows, flash the light, blow the horn, find out how fast it's going, because I loaned the car to my daughter, and then I start getting notification that it was going faster than 80 miles an hour. So I called her up and I said, hey, you're gonna mess up my insurance. But it, it got to me that, yeah, we, we are now purchasing all these things that can surveil us, so we are, and with the participants in this. And that's a great point. The Thank surveillance you. is sometimes good when you want to monitor your daughter, but it's bad when it happens to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> My daughter is 40 years old, so I was taking her car to the next Can I have references? So, so the automation, you, the, the data we're coming from cars, they go back to the car dealers, they go back to your insurance providers, they also all, everybody gets funneled back to like LexisNexis. And all of that information is being pooled up at the bigger information collection so, data brokers points. Yeah, and it's yeah. all one hacker away. And it's just one hacker away. Like literally, there's a whole system that disabled an entire line of cars yeah. that they, they track. Oh, hey, there's yeah, a flaw. It was like when hackers breached the Tesla system and were driving Teslas off automated. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of issues. I think we, we don't have uh, time to get in all, all of the cars issues, and it's a great topic, but uh, yeah, you mentioned a number one of these issues, uh, and as I say that I just take one away from this, which is the, the data broker, broker aspect of it. And a Fourth Amendment problem that I see uh, is that, you know, there, the government's required to go to a court to, to get this thing via a warrant, or they can just buy it from the data broker. And that is a uh, you know a workaround to the Fourth Amendment, and so actually Biden again put out a bill called the Fourth Amendment is not for sale to actually try to stop this practice of uh, you know getting around the warrant requirement from simply buying it from a, a data broker, uh, which I think would would be good, but it raises these these issues, and what we need to have is a situation where you can take advantage of technologies interconnected systems and yet not be sacrificing all of your rights at the same time. And we do not have time for this, but the, the, the key doctrine that we need to deal with there is the uh, third party doctrine, which is the doctrine that uh, the, the DOJ has been, been taking advantage of for, for decades that says if your data is held by a third party, you, you lose your privacy interests. And there was a Supreme Court case a couple years back, Carpenter versus US, which for the, uh, refused to extend the, the third-party doctrine to information about your location that came from the phone company. That, that, 
this was a step too far. And that is, it was a great case, a real pushback on that doctrine, but only in that one instance, and that's an area where we have to extend it, and extending it to your car, maybe there's phones in that case, but extending it to your car location seems like a logical thing. But uh, that will have to be a different session. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you so much for your questions and for attending. Have a good con, and please rate your panel.